This is episode 36 of Hoops Forum, a production of Radius Athletics and a quick timeout podcast. He's Randy Sherman, and I'm Tony Miller. And on today's show, we're going to be talking defense. If you're watching, you can see there at the bottom, we're really going to dive into building your defensive system. This isn't necessarily going to be a step-by-step. -step. This is how you should do it, one, two, three, four. But Randy has a lot of great questions that I think is helpful for us here at the start of the season to think through and hopefully will maybe help your clear your thinking maybe and then also help you become even a better communicator teaching to your players what matters most on the defensive end before we get started big thanks to our sponsors at 323 sports as i said the basketball season is here so you probably have most everything in order for your season but if by chance you have something still left maybe need some more basketballs or score books or really anything 323 sports can help you get that thing whatever that is there to your school on time and at a great price to find out more about what they can do for your basketball program, visit 323sports.com, or you can contact a rep at sales at 323sports.com. They'll be sure to do it right for your sports program. You know, as, as you know, Randy and I were talking at the beginning, and it is one thing for a coach to know what a 2-3 zone is or know what a man-to-man -man, uh, scheme looks like. It's another thing, especially when you're a first coach. I think most, maybe all of us encountered this. Teaching it is something different. And I I like this because at its core, at my core, I'm a teacher, but I think that some probably some of the stuff that we're going to discuss today will make you a better teacher. Is that kind of the sense that you get, Randy, uh, even working with your coaches? They probably know about a lot of things, but when it comes to actually communicating it, it's a different ballgame. Yeah, it's the synthesis of that information and, 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 and uh, you know, you're tasked with something that's not easy as a coach, and that's to take what's what's in your head. Maybe it's your vision and articulate it and bring it to life. And um, and that's uh, that's 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 hard. I mean, that's not easy. So I think that, um, you know, the genesis of this article that we're going to kind of pick apart here and talk about was was just kind of conversations I'm having this time of the year with coaches who are planning out their practices. Right. So. Like, okay, we decided we're going to play man-to-man -man defense uh, as, a, as a team or a program. And, and okay, I, I've made that decision, but now I've got to decide how I'm going to implement it, what concept, in what order, like what builds upon what. And that's kind of what I tried to do in the article um, was sort of like lay out that, that uh, progression or teaching sequence mm -hmm. that I, I tended to use and follow. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for younger younger coaches, like there's not one right way to do that. And you address that even in your article. Yeah, but there can sometimes be a more logical way that probably people will understand better. And I think especially for your players, you know, you understand things at a much higher level because you've been around the game and you've mm -hmm. studied the game. But your players, it may not be that logical to them. And so I think that's where the clarity of becoming a great teacher is how can I communicate to this simple enough so that they can understand it. And so for even we're going to talk about individual parts. I know everybody wants to talk about you said, like, what's the first thing I do? Then the second then the third. I think the real magic happens is when your players understand those individual parts in the context of the whole. Yeah. And especially on the defensive end. That's what makes you a great defensive team. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, there's definitely not one right recipe, if you will. Like like a, a lot of trial and error is involved in coaching. Like, you know, that 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 drill didn't work or that that just didn't come across like I thought it would or you know so I'm not going to say that again or teach it that way again that's that's the evolution of coaching over your your career span it's always in flux in 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 and hopefully refining um you know what we're going to talk about today is a simple way to sort of outline defense starting from the ball out and Again, it's not the only way. Some some coaches might teach it like one skill at a time. We're going to do a closeout drill, a, a help side drill, a switching or handling off ball screen drill, and just teach it a skill or a drill at a time. And that that's could be fine too. Um, and and so yeah, that's what we're going to get into is kind of how I outlined the progression, and that's just one person, right? So. Uh, so yeah. we gave it away in the title, but yeah. it's starting on the ball and working your way out. But in relationship to that first question of, you know, how are we going to guard the ball? What are some of the questions that a coach should address and think about? It's not just, okay, well, we just start on the ball, and, you know, put a lot of pressure on the ball. It's more to it than that, right? Yeah, I would say, you know, two things come to mind is stance and pickup point. 
And, and uh, that, so those would be sort of like questions as a coach. Philosophically, I would want to get into my coaching DNA, like my personality, my coaching DNA, and kind of maybe think about um, those two things, stance and pickup point. What, when we're teaching and presenting on the ball defense to our players, what, what, what's our teaching points for our on the ball stance? Are we angled? Are we squared up? Is there, uh, what, what sort of cushion are we giving the player? And, and when are we okay with step slide? When are we ready to turn and run? Just things like that. Are we, are we squared up? Are we influencing in a certain direction? And, and as far as pickup point, um, you know, at just like it sounds, at what point do we begin to engage the ball? Half court line, you know, volleyball line, top of the key. That that those are all like like we said about. There's no one right way, and you got to work with your team. And and but really, just I think a lot of this is just in your coaching DNA. If you're an aggressive type person who wants to play an aggressive style, then your pickup point might be higher. For another guy, it might be lower. But I just like to throw these questions out there. So like, okay, what, where do we start? What are we teaching? Well, that starts with some of some philosophical uh, decisions. And then we kind of work from there. Yeah. Once you get those big systems in place, I've been talking with my team about like, what are the micro skills and how are we going to execute those micro skills? And the micro skills are the stance, how close I am to the ball. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, where the pickup point is within our larger transition defense sequence mm -hmm. what that looks like when the ball gets to a certain part on the floor and now we transition from that point to now we're playing in our half court defense you know these are the these are the details that for me as a young coach maybe i was the exception but for me as a young coach like i didn't think about this that deeply and once i did yeah. it made my team well I, I wouldn't i would yeah, go ahead yeah. oh i was gonna say i, I wouldn't I would say, you know, on the defensive side of the ball too, that like, I think there's a tendency sometimes for coaches to be like technique junkies about defense. And that seems a little, um, uh, that's a pretty big ask, right? Like we don't have the ball. We're not in control. We're the, the offense says go. So like by, by its nature, defense is sort of like dynamic and reactionary. So, so I'm supposed to guard this guy and I'm supposed to do it with my foot right here, 37.6 degrees like this coach, you know, like, like, like that's a, that, I think we're not empathetic to players sometimes like when we get too far technique junkie about defense. Um, I found it's almost of, two extremes. It's either that or it's a defense is just effort and hustle. And I don't think either, either of those is correct. Yeah, no, um, the technique, matters to a degree right but an effort and hustle matters only to a degree if we're if we're giving great effort but we're sloppy and don't help one another and things like that we're just getting sweaty right mm -hmm. so uh, uh yeah so i'd say i'd say find that balance between how much of a stickler i'm going to be on technique and how much of uh you know i'm i just concerned more about the outcome right mm -hmm. so um, and, the, and, you know, I think there's, there's, that is a balance. Mm -hmm. Where would you rank this skill of on ball in all skills in relationship to basketball, both sides of the ball? Second to shooting. That's the second most premium skill in the sport, like mm -hmm. shooting being first guard, being able to guard the ball one V one, I would say is the, the second most important you know, tangible on the court basketball skill. And unfortunately I found at least at my level, it's probably the number one thing that players have the hardest time doing when they transition. They have a very difficult time guarding the basketball, which yeah. is ironic, I think, but yeah. Well, when right. it, it's, it's hard, it's yeah. just hard, you know? Yeah. All right. As we move our way out, then moving from on the ball defense, the next logical progression is just one pass away. Yeah. So, you know, like the title suggests, was we're building our defense from the ball outward. So what I tended to lay out first to my team that like introduced first is how we're guarding the ball. Here's our stance. Here's our checkpoints. Here's our, you know, pickup point and all that stuff. And then and then our next defensive skill that we implement had to do had to do with with uh, how we're going to, you know, there's, we, we've talked, we've got, you know, think of it as we're going from 1v1 to 2v2, right? Like we got a player with the ball and the player guarding him 
applying all the things we talked about with on-ball defense, and now we've got a player one pass away. What are we teaching his or her defender one pass away? So some more questions to consider. Are you going to deny passes? If so, using what stance and how far out and how far up the line and all the technical things, if you're going to deny passes, or are you going to be a team that plugs gaps and helps one pass away? Are you, you know, are you going to stunt at drivers or stay home? Things like that. Just little small things to consider when you're one pass away. Um, I would say, you know, kind of like if I was looking at a team and I would just, you know, quick glance, I just turn the television on and like I'd say their one pass away defense tells me a lot about their coaches place on the spectrum of pressure versus containment right so so just just that one quick characteristic i can pick up on a on a on a philosophy of like yeah they're they're more worried about containment they're sitting in gaps well this team's really trying to pressure they're out in passing lanes so um you know i think that's the biggest driver of that pressure versus containment um seesaw if you will that um that 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 one pass away philosophy. How much does personnel impact your decision to be the con- more of a containing team versus a denial team? I'd say quite a lot, but I mean, for that could depend on coaching situation to coaching situation. And some coaches are more apt to, to just sort of be like, yeah, we're probably not ready to play this way right now, but like, we're going to do it anyway and just get better and, you know, kind of build a program from the start, you know, that that's one philosophy. And, Another philosophy might be, well, I got a quick athletic team. We're going to play this way this year, and next year uh, maybe I don't. We're going to play another way. That mm-hmm. that's that can that can vary from personality to personality. And you know, you see some coaches who just kind of do the same thing every year and use their program to sort of give players skills to meet what they how they want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, all I would say to that is just whether you you know, want to be one or the other is up to you, but just don't view your players' current skills and abilities as their permanent skills and abilities. That would be anti-growth mindset. If if I wanted us to be a pressure man, that's what's in my coaching DNA, but I didn't have quickness. Well, okay. At least I know what I need to develop. Some more quickness. We got to get in better shape. We got to cut some weight. We got to get quicker, more athletic, get in the weight room, get our speed work in and things like that to to, to be more able to play the way I want to play. That's, mm-hmm. that's okay. But if I, 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 I just feel like with that, it's just sort of like, does the coach have more of the idea of like, we're going to grow into what we want to do, or I'm just going to do what my players can do right now. And that, mm-hmm. Either one's fine. <laughs> you know, this is a larger conversation. So don't feel like you have to answer in depth, but how much are you into pairing what you do on the defensive end with the offensive side of the ball? Me personally, I was pretty into that. Um, that that if that we're just trying to create an up tempo game, and and the game being four phases of offense, transition defense, defense transition offense, uh, then then we want to sort of like use tactics in all of those phases that that push the tempo, and and get and get a high possession game, but. Um, you know, there's certainly good examples of teams out there who maybe like do like more of a counterattacking philosophy where there may be more of a containment style defense when they get a rebound or get scored on, they, they counterattack quickly. That's, that's okay too. Uh, you know, we could, we could dive deeper into that, but, but, you know, this is kind of like the questions I pose of like, what are we doing one pass away? And, and does it do, what's our rationale? What, what do we trying to accomplish. And I'd say that's one something probably not mentioned in the article we're dissecting would be, and am I aware of the trade-offs of that and okay with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So like, like, like don't be the coach who helps one pass away and like saying, because we want to contain, we want to, you know, penetrate, you know, stop penetration. We're going to sell out to stop penetration. And then when you, you know, get three shot over the top of you, don't whine and complain. Like you got what you asked for. Don't be the denial coach and like, wow, they're just driving right by us or we're in foul trouble. Well, what do you, what'd you expect them to do? They can't pass to one another, right? So um, just just sort of be aware of like why you're doing it and what you can live with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, next, working even further away mm-hmm. from the ball here, talking about what a lot of people called the weak side or the back side. 
you have a different term for it and a very specific reason for that. What is that? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of other coaches do also call it the help side. Um, but that I just sort of like trained and train myself when I'm speaking on this subject to call it help side to players, to coaches, because I want it to be very clear what the players on that side of the floor's primary responsibility is. And that's help <laughs> your, your, uh, you know, there's there's ball side and you, and our responsibility is to guard the ball and and, and one pass away in, in a pressure man system on the help side. You're there to help. Like that's where all our help's going to come from. So um, I, I picked my words carefully because I wanted it to convey the meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and and if you think of like our progression, the conversation today from one on one, one player guarding one player with the ball one player plus another player denying one or, or in the gap, one pass away. We've now moved to where maybe we've got three or more players and there's, in, and, and now the ball can go on a side and I'm, we've got to teach players things like uh, when the ball is opposite of your side of the court, you're on help side, you're not on ball side. Where should I be? Where, what position should I be in? Where on the court should I be? And, and, um, and, uh, you know, how far off my man, how far in the paint, one foot, two foot, um, you know, things like that. Uh, uh, what about when the ball's above the free throw line or below the free throw line? Should I be in or deeper in or or things like that? And when you get into help side defense, those are some questions to consider. Like, like you know, I, I don't want those players on the weak on the weak. See, I almost did it. I almost slipped in and said weak side. I, I don't want the players on the help side to to be sort of like feeling like they're like out of the action right like oh, i'm over here like i get to you know kind of zone out right like mm -hmm. tune out uh you know i want them to you know know that i know you have you have very important duty when you're on that side of the floor and and uh and because it's very important this is where i want you to position yourself stance wise and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. i like just calling it help side conversations that we've had as well as some of the others that I've heard. I think the importance of terminology is understated still for many coaches and even just calling it this can get into your, the mindset of your players there, something that is expected of them in relationship to their closeouts, their positioning, you know, the help recover, are we X and out, those types of things. Yeah. So it may sound like semantics, but I, I think it does make a big impact. And we've tried to make an adjustment that this year with our players in, in using more loaded phrases yeah. to help them teach, help teach. And then also to help them remember what we're trying to accomplish. So I like that. Yeah. So also when you've kind of built your defense to this level of, of, you know, we've worked from the ball outward from on ball to one pass away to now, you know, we're, we're talking about both sides of the floor uh, help side. That's when I sort of like, when we got to this point, felt like I needed to teach closeouts and things like that because and defensive rotations because now that 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 involves the help side player uh you know say if you know imagine like a three guard front the ball's on the wing we've got a, a guy one pass away a guy on the ball and we got a guy on help side and they skip it and and you know we try to define define what a closeout is and a closeout is when you go straight from help to ball you did you, without passing go and collecting two hundred dollars right like you go straight from help to ball is, is when you execute our closeout teaching points and, mm -hmm. and, you know, some questions to consider around closeout technique. Are we, are we want to, are we, are we, you know, are we going to be technique driven or outcome driven? Are we, are we chopping short or are we running people off the line or, you know, so that sort of, to me was in the help side chapter of our defensive install, all things close out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then defensive rotations as well, because like if, you know, say we're, you know, three guard front balls on the wing and a guy drives baseline, well, the help side player then is put into the action. Our help comes from the help side. So we've got to now he's going to help. He's going to help the helper and you're going to rotate that, those sorts of things and uh, work on that in three on three and then four on four and then five on five. So that was a lot of questions. And if somebody's watching this, they may feel a little bit overwhelmed. The process that I found and just talking with Randy and then kind of thinking about our own team this year, I've tried to go and think about what what's the most important skill, skills, micro skills, mm -hmm. things that our defense sees 
regularly in a single right. possession. So yeah. go back and watch. You're going to get an opportunity here at the start of your seasons. Film your practices when you get the opportunity to do your 4v4s or 5v4s and just watch a single possession of defense and see – Based off of the system that apparently I'm employing now, maybe you know what, what that is. Mm -hmm. Maybe some you're figuring out what that is. But what are we seeing constantly? So for our team, we were seeing constantly being able to stop the ball was obvious. I mean, I think that that's common amongst anybody's defensive system. Mm -hmm. But then we were also seeing because of the type of closeouts that we use, we don't run them off the line, but it does – it does end up resulting in more drives to the basket, which result in more stepping over and then helping on the backside and Xing out out of that. Yeah. And so I was able to come up with probably about seven or eight things that happen quite frequently in every single defensive possession. Yeah. And answering the questions of, okay, how are we going to both teach those to our players and then mm -hmm. also rep them in practice. And that has really helped in, determining on a daily basis what our practice plan needs to look like. And so you end up actually practicing things that matters. I know that sounds like an easy, but I still yeah. feel like a lot of coaches practice a lot of dumb things that really only kind of matter to winning or kind of matter to what they're going to see in an actual game. Yeah. That's to me, that's brilliant. And I think it, I, I, I like the way you're thinking. And as you were talking, I was thinking that what Tony's doing is taking an offenses, offensive coach's mindset and applying it to coaching defense. So, like, if you just say we were going to be a ball screen offense, well, we would do, you know, and we're going to set ball screens on every ball reversal, like Euro continuity or something like that. Well, obviously, our offensive, because it's going to happen a lot, we're going to break down that ball, that side ball screen a lot, right? Like, well, that because that's inherent and it's a big driver of success of your offense. Well, if you know that, you know, defensively, because we play, I don't know, example is like we play on the line, up the line, and we're going to extend with a high pickup point. Well, we're probably going to get driven a lot. So we've got to learn how to help and rotate on drives. That's that's brilliant to me. That's yeah. that. And that's to me, it would be, you know, getting getting in touch with the with the trade-offs of your defensive style, right? My example of on the line, up the line, high pickup point, the, the trade-off, if you will, is we're going to get driven. Like I'm not going into the season expecting we're not going to get driven. That is going to happen. Like probably on possession one of game one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so that's what we have to be excellent at because like we need to be good enough to cover up that trade-off. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And if, it's even... And if, and if we were like more of a containment style where we're sitting in gaps and we're sort of letting letting a team run its offense, well, we might have to spend more time on defending screens and actions and things like that. And we're because they're they're able to do that. And, that, and we want to work on, OK, when they when they down screen, we're going to switch or we're going to curl and uh, or trail and trail and show or something like that. Lock and trail, uh, you know, like you've got to get better at defending actions because that's what you're going to see. Mm hmm. And it's caused me to not get mad when a guy gets beat off the dribble. I, I, I understand that that's going to happen, but then it allows me to not get frustrated and miss the opportunity to teach the help and rotate. It's actually caused me to the next day set aside six or eight minutes to work on a small sided game where we are starting with an advantage for the mm -hmm. offense to beat their man off the dribble. And then we just immediately help and rotate. And I get reps now, multiple reps, from players helping and rotating rather than getting mad at the guy who got beat off the dribble yeah. and then spending the next day, which is I'm sure one of our biases the next day working on closeouts for 20 minutes. Yeah. Or, or just telling them things like you got to want it more. You're not, we need right. some more dogs or like, we don't, you know, like, all right, well, you know, the, this is what we're asking for. If you're talking about an on the line, up the line, high pickup point style, like you're asking to get driven. So you better be ready for it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Different kind of conversation today. I love these because I do feel like it makes coaches better teachers. And I think that's where we spend most of our time is actually teaching. If you're a great coach, you spend most of your time thinking probably more about practice than you do even the games. Hopefully something that we said today helped you to become a better teacher. Yeah. As we wrap things up here, if you're wanting to increase your revenue as a athletic program or maybe improve the fan experience at your sporting events, you need to look into the scoreboards and the score tables available from Sideline Interactive.
They're the leading manufacturers and tables and video display boards for high schools and colleges around the country. To find out more about Sideline Interactive, simply visit sidelineinteractive.com. Randy, this, what we talked about today, was actually something that you had written. Maybe some of you, some that were listening, heard about the article that we were referencing. But can you tell them about that, where they can find that, and how they can avail themselves to articles like this? Yeah, I went out to newsletter uh, subscribers, um, radiusathletics.substack.com. You can find it on my Twitter bio, just um, in the link in the bio, um, or my Twitter feed. You'll find me reference the article in our announcement about this conversation today. Um, but, and when I put this on my YouTube channel, I'll put the link to the article somewhere in the, in the description. But um, yeah, so inside out ball, one pass away, help side. And then from there, you kind of, then what we would progress to was sort of the nitty gritty, like defending the post and, screens and things like that but the big stuff we kind of talked about today is d- addressed in that article randy ha- is in touch with basketball coaches he understands that they are busy and his newsletters are you get in you get a lot of information in just a few paragraphs and it is packed full of great stuff and then you get out and you've only taken five to ten minutes but you've learned a whole lot that will make your team a lot better so definitely check that out Appreciate all of you who joined us this week. If you missed any part of the live show, you can go back and watch the full version at Radius Athletics on YouTube. Just simply search Hoops Forum or Radius Athletics. If you want to listen to the full version, you can search a Quick Timeout podcast, and there you'll find the audio version of the show. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. We'll talk to you again next week on Hoops Forum.